Okay, welcome everyone. Nice to see you here today. This is our first student talk back uh, lunch discussion of the semester. So thanks for joining us this semester. Um, as is the case every semester, we are joined here today with, uh, by our partners at the USC Daily Trojan, whom I will announce in just a moment. And um, of course, our partners in the two student organizations, College Republicans, College Democrats. So thank you all for being part of this series once again. For those of you I don't know, my name is Kirsten Olson. I'm the interim director of the Unruh Institute of Politics this semester. And I will begin by uh, introducing our distinguished panel here today. To my left, your right, is Yasmin Sirhan. She's the editorial director of the USC Daily Trojan. And just going down the uh, table here, we have Jennifer Massey, who is the president of the USC College Republicans. Welcome, Jennifer. Tony Strickland, uh, one of our inaugural class of legislators and residents. Tony Strickland is a, uh, he was a former state senator for the state of California. He actually just announced his candidacy for U.S. Congress for the District 25, representing Simi Valley, Santa Clarita, Palmdale, and Lancaster. Congratulations, Tony. We wish you the best. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Shikhar Gupta, who is the Vice President of USC College Democrats. And finally, but certainly not, not least, we have our friend <laughs> Anthony Fortentino, who is a former State Assemblyman for the State of California, also a former mayor of the city of La Cunada, Flint Ridge, and a former member of the LA, I'm sorry, La Cunada, La Cunada Flint Ridge City Council. So please join me in welcoming our panel. So the subject of today's uh, discussion is going to be talking about the president's agenda over the next, uh, the re remainder of his term over the next couple of years. And as I'm sure we all saw from the State of the Union <coughs> speech last night, the president laid forth a very ambitious agenda talked about a lot of the things that he can accomplish over the next few years. And one of the things that he said, and I will quote him directly, <laughs> on the heels of his announcement that the federal, he would raise the federal minimum wage for certain federal contract workers to $10.10 .10 an hour, he said that where possible, he was going to bypass Congress and act alone. So our first question to the panel, and for anyone who would like to answer this question first, please join in. To what extent can the president legislate, effectively legislate from the White House over the next two years? What's politically expedient for him to do, and what can he actually accomplish? First of all, thanks for everybody taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. Um, I was actually uh, taken aback by uh, that comment from the president, um, because pretty much what the president's saying is now I, I'm really a lame duck. I, I really am not working well with Congress, and so I'm going to do everything that I can do on my own. It doesn't send a message for the last two years of his, um, his administration uh, that says he's going to get a lot done. For example, the minimum wage uh, that he's going to do by executive order, it's only for new federal employees. Um, so it really doesn't cover that many people. It's more semantics, um, which is really surprising, uh, especially after you won the re-election campaign. Uh, I was here a year ago at this panel saying, uh, if you looked at his uh, inaugural address, almost everything on that address was not going to get accomplished. I mean, he mentioned minimum wage. Minimum wage is a dead non-starter within the Congress. Um, and that agenda he laid out really didn't get a lot done from that agenda. And so now, uh, I said back then, and I say it now, is uh, he didn't have to face the voters again, and he had a decision whether to work to kind of move things forward and get things done, or to kind of be um, someone who uh, fights uh, on the left side. Um, and if you look at the history of the way uh, things have gone in recent history, when things usually get done the most is when we have divided government. When Clinton was president, uh, he got a lot done working with Newt Gingrich in the Republican Congress. He worked across the aisle, figured out where they had common ground, got that done. We talked about balanced budget amendment, NAFTA, and many other things. When Reagan was president, he had an overwhelming Democratic Congress, and he worked very well with Tip O'Neill on common ground. Uh, you don't see a lot of this common ground uh, in this current administration, and um, after last night's speech, I don't think you're going to see very much in the, in the near future. 
Mr. Portantino. Well, um, I think it's important to note, uh, first of all, thank you all for being out, and I want to congratulate uh, Kirsten for uh, being the acting director of the Enro Institute. It's good to have you moderating, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, you know, back in the mid 80s, um, historians wrote that one of the issues that bring back the society is a lack of leadership. You know, there's natural, natural calamity hurts the society, but not having strong leaders is something that uh, they were predicting the future of, Cal of California, the future of America, that we were facing a time when we needed leaders. Um, and I think if we look back in history, when we look at presidents, we revere and we appreciate those presidents who showed leadership. Certainly, um, Abraham Lincoln showed leadership. Ronald Reagan issued 381 executive orders. And we talk about Ronald Reagan being a strong leader. Um, I think at a time of partisan gridlock in Congress, uh, Americans want things to work. I think Americans are less partisan than the politicians who represent them. And I think they're tired of gridlock. So for me, to have a president stand up and say, Congress, if you don't get your act together and do things, I'm going to seize the opportunity and I'm going to do things. I think that's welcome news to many, many people around our country who want things to work. And they don't really care whether there's an R or a D associated with the idea. And I think you see with President Obama, who embraced a Republican proposal in the Affordable Care Act, which had its genesis from a conservative think tank, only to have his hand slapped by the very people who proposed the idea, I think he sang, get over it. We have to make it work. And if you don't act, I'm going to act. And whether that's on creating jobs, whether that's on creating environmental policies um, to make our next generation have clean air and clean water, I think he's going to try to seize the moment. That being said, there is certainly room to try to reach out to folks. And I think what he was saying last night is, I'm going to reach out, but if you don't do it, I'm going to use the executive orders that are in the Constitution to do what I can. And I think that's good, because we want our country to work. We don't want it to be stuck in gridlock. And so I don't have a problem with a leader being a leader, because that's why we elect leaders to lead. And Chico and uh, Jennifer, just to give you the exact quote he said, he said, America does not stand still and neither will I. So how does that resonate with folks of your generation? How, how does that sit with you? I guess it's more like looking at the fact, like as um, Mr. Portantino just said, it's the fact that Obama's taking the um, initiative to actually go out and do something. In the past few years, we really haven't seen much happen. This past year has been really all about it gridlocked and kind of just divided Congress. And a lot of people really haven't um, been happy with that, as you can see with Congress's approval ratings dropping below 10% and Obama's ratings dropping to the 30s. It, um, and what he did is he took a very hopeful tone with this and he took a very assertive tone with the State of the Union. And by taking that tone, he's basically saying that, hey, I want to get something done. And using the executive orders in that case would be getting something done. Uh, looking at like statistics from the past, I think all the way going back to FDR, every president so far has used nearly double the number of executive orders that President Obama has used. So President Obama has not been extremely assertive with those executive orders in his past, I think like five years now. And he's trying to make a change to that and actually get something done. Um, as the presidents in the past have done as well. I don't believe that the American public is going to uh, be happy with Obama acting as a dictator when our founding fathers made sure that we had a government of checks and balances with three branches of government. So if he goes, goes ahead and does his things on his own and not work with the other side of the aisle, I don't think the American public is, uh, like I said, going to be happy with him at all. And the fact that he you know, said that last night and has been saying that a lot lately, I think it scares a lot of the Americans out there right now. 
Um, so I, I think we can all agree, kind of as all the panels have touched on, that there is this intense, unprecedented gridlock in Congress. Um, so for Tony and Anthony, as, as legislators, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing both sides of the aisle in 2014? And do you think we can overcome this, this gridlock? The answer is yes. Um, obviously, we can overcome the gridlock, um, but the real uh, challenge is uh, you have a president that doesn't trust the leaders uh, in Congress, and you have leaders in Congress that doesn't trust the president. I will tell you, um, there's a lot of things that Anthony and I disagree on when we're in the legislature, but we worked uh, to try to find common ground on what we can work together. We agreed to disagree, uh, which we will today, uh, on, a lot of, on a lot of issues. But I think real challenge of real leadership is offering a vision, but also knowing, for example, as I know Anthony, uh, knowing he represents Pasadena, La Quina, Flint Ridge, and knowing the pressures of his constituency, and him understanding mine, and, and being able to roll up the sleeves and say, hey, we can get along. We can go to lunch, we can go to a cup of coffee, we can go to breakfast, um, and if we like each other, then we can learn how to work with each other. I think the biggest, problem you have right here is an administration and a president, um, and quite frankly, and a, the, the tones, it's not the amount of executive orders, but it's the tone of coming to Congress and saying, I don't need you, I'm just do this on my own. I don't think that sets the tone of saying, hey, let's work together on some big issues in my last few years of, of Congress. So I really think it's about knowing who you're working with and that trust factor, and there's really no trust from the president to the congressional leaders and congressional leaders to the president. <coughs> Well, I think when you think about the challenges, um, I think the, the fundamental biggest challenge facing America, facing California, is the economy. Um, we have had dramatic shifts in the job market. Um, there were statistics that were released, uh, I think, two weeks ago about the number of college graduates and law school graduates who are working in underemployment. Um, the number of baristas who are law school graduates is staggering. Um, a service economy where the starting salary is $25,000 a year is not a sustainable economy to have a thriving middle class. And if you look at historically, um, college graduates um, <coughs> were starting in salaries significantly higher than they're starting today. And to me, um, I think that was one of the markers that the president put down last night is we have to do something for the middle class in, in our country. Um, and it's a challenge because are we a manufacturing economy? Some would argue not anymore. Are we, have we embraced a <coughs> high-tech economy? Somewhat but not completely. Um, the days where you started sweeping floors at the supermarket and 10 years later were the assistant manager and 15 years later the manager, that doesn't exist anymore. And so to me, fundamentally, if we heal or have a vision for the economy, many of the other things fall into place. And I think, in some respects, Tony's right. We have to work together to get there. But the partisan divide over what's in the best interest of the economy is so great that we really do need leadership to say, your futures demand that we do better to see that you don't graduate from USC and work in a service economy. So to me, that, I think, is the biggest challenge facing Congress and facing our country. Um, Jennifer and Shaker, maybe you guys can touch on um, what you think specifically that you think Congress can, going forward, kind of come to terms and agree on, and what, what kind of topics or issues you think that they can find some common ground. Um, one of the big things, I think, is also like the culture of Congress and the culture in Washington, D.C. that has led to polarization over the years. From a lot of um, speakers or like um, talks, um, I often hear people saying like back in the 80s or the 90s, 
where even though there still was this kind of like, you know, completely partisan divide, you had a Republican president and a Democratic House or vice versa. Um, the culture in D.C. was different where um, oftentimes the congressmen, congresswomen, the president, the families, they all kind of got along and like there was a lot more interaction and that sort of interaction is what um, led to less sort of divide. And in the past years, um, in the past, like, past few years, there really hasn't been as much of that sort of collaboration between both the sides. And that has led to, I think, probably one of like the greater polariz polarizations between the two sides. So something that does need to be done is probably like, you know, establishing greater rapport, greater t trust between both sides. As uh, Mr. Strickland said earlier, you know, um, they got to be willing to work with each other to get something done. And until that's done, I mean, it's really hard to find a common ground until they're willing <clears throat> to talk to each other. I, I, yeah, I agree with everything he said. I spoke, and that's probably not going to happen. I think the biggest thing is they both need to realize what compromise means. And compromise means it, it doesn't just you agree with everything that I want, and then we're, we're, we're great, and we're working together. That's not how it works. And both sides need to realize, um, and maybe need to, I'll send them the definition of compromise later today, my public leaders. Um, also, I think that the, the issues that they could work on together would probably be creating job opportunity and reducing the federal budget deficit. Uh, there was an NBC Wall Street Journal poll last week that asked what Americans thought were the biggest issues facing 2014. And it was about 91% said creating jobs and 74% was reducing the federal budget deficit. And I don't think the president touched on that at all last night in the State of the Union. So if, I think if both, both uh, parties listen to what the American people think is important and want to, to be the priority for 2014, then they can have some common ground on both of those issues. The president has definitely stated that this is the defining issue of our time, uh, mitigating economic inequality. So I think philosophically both parties agree. It's just a matter of how we you know, make changes that are durable, lasting changes for the future. Uh, one other point that uh, we'd like to talk about that's more uh, specific from last night's speech was the fact that the president alluded to climate change. And the portion of his speech, in fact, with our, with our viewing with the students last night that got probably the second biggest arousal from the audience was the fact that he said, climate change is a fact, the debate is settled. And when our children and grandchildren ask us, did we act, we need to be able to say, yes, we did. That's a bit of a loaded statement, right? It's a bit of a loaded statement from both sides. And it also resonates back to his original campaign themes. Yes, we can, hope and change. What specifically do you think the president meant by saying that so declaratively last night? Go ahead. I, I believe when he said that so emphatically, um, with so much emotion, he was trying to convince the American people that there's no need for any more discussion on this topic, which is invalidating millions of scientists around the world have not come to the conclusion that it is in a fact. There's so many that think the other way. So I think the discussion um, we'll go a lot further, but him saying that last night, it's obvious that he wants to push forward some legislation, uh, more legislation with the EPA um, in, in the next couple of years, not just 2014. I feel like one of the factors in like, you know, contributing to that could also be the, um, the fact like um, of the extreme weather scene within the United States in like the past couple of months. Um, I mean, the whole polar vortex thing in the East Coast, then um, Governor Brown just declared a drought in California a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, we haven't really seen much rain in California in the past, like, past year or so. So um, all of that really um, kind of uncertainty with the climate and people kind of wondering what's going on could also contribute to President Obama trying to make an emphatic statement about trying to, you know, we got to do something about this, and this is, you know, my perspective on it, and I think that might be where he's coming from with that as well. Um, well, in terms, of, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Anthony. I was saying you've been going first. I was going to give go you ahead. a chance to, go ahead. to beat me up after I pointed. Good. Go ahead. Uh, um, you know, in, in government, whenever you don't want something to happen, you form a committee. 
<laughs> right? How many times have you gone to the administration to complain about something and all of a sudden there's a task force that's going to come back with a report three years later and tell you what you knew three years before and make recommendations that then sit on a shelf, right? I think what the president was saying is get over it. You know, whether it's the Affordable Care Act and 47 bills to repeal something that's law, or stop debating climate change and let's have policies that make our grandchildren proud of us for making them have clean air when they're our age. And I think that's laudable. You know, no one would argue what my esteemed colleague from the University of Southern California just talked about. There's dramatic changes in the economy, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, um, weather. Get over it. Let's put in place things that make the air cleaner, the water drinkable, our vehicles run more efficiently. I mean, who would argue, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, that having a car that has less emissions is a good thing or a bad thing? Is that a partisan issue? If you close your garage door and you leave your car on, you die, right? <laughs> Don't you? Yes, sir. Right? Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, if the garage door is shut and your car's on, you die. The world has a roof. The more pollution you put under the roof, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It shouldn't even be a partisan conversation. We should have clean air, clean water. Cars that don't emit bad things. And I think that's what the president was saying. Get over it. Let's just clean it up and make our grandchildren proud. <laughs> I actually think that's the problem with the president. He says, get over it. Why don't you agree with me? I told you I was going to get a chance. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like he's a little five-year-old kid that stomps if the parent says no. Um, not everybody, this, this, this is not solved, not everybody has agreed. There are scientists out there that have questioned uh, climate change. <clears throat> and I have a, a benefit of being a little bit older than a lot of folks, but you know, in terms of California and a water drought, I hate to tell you, uh, this has been uh, a problem for the state of California ever since we became a state. Um, the water fights that we've had from north to south, um, that's not Republican Democrat when we're in the legislature, it's Northern California fighting uh, to keep more of the water against Southern California that has a large base of population. And we've been fighting for things like water storage, so that's not new. The other thing is when I was a kid, it was called global cooling. And then when I was, you know, when I was young, it was called global cooling. And then all of a sudden it became global warming. And now all of a sudden it's climate change. Um, is there man-made um, problems with the uh, environment? I'm not a scientist. I, but I know that that's not solved right now. The, there is going to be discussion, no matter how much President Obama wants to say, get over it. Um, it's still in question um, of the science world. I will tell you, um, it's not, if you look at the history of the world, we did have the ice age. I mean, there is climate change just on the natural. The real question is, how much is man-made? And, you know, neither Anthony, myself, or President Obama, or scientists, uh, and I, I, I believe that that statement is another statement that says, you know, why don't you agree with me? I want to put this off to the side because I don't have the debate. I think that's a debate that is worth having, whether uh, President Obama's right or whether other folks are right. Um, it's a debate, and for him to say get over it or him to say it, there's no more debate on it, I just think that that's um, not, not accurate. So I just want to remind you that uh, at the uh, midpoint of the hour, we turn this dialogue over to all of you, and we'd like, love to hear some of your questions. So just to plant the seed, we have one more question for each one of our panelists, but if you could all begin thinking of your questions, please do. Um, so if, if climate change got the second most round of applause last night, then the Mad Men comment probably the first. Um, <coughs> for all of you who caught the State of the Union last night, um, President Obama called for a need for equal pay, for equal work between men and women alike, saying that it is time to do away with the workplace policies that belong in a Mad Men episode. Um, so my question for the panel is, what importance can we see workplace equality taking going forward to 2016? Well, certainly as the father of two daughters, 
who someday want to retire and have them take care of me. I want them to be extremely successful. Um, actually, my 22-year-old just texted me just before the panel to wish me happy birthday. Today's my birthday. So she wished me happy birthday. Um, but I think it's a couple things are important. Um, statistically, do you know that corporations that promote women actually do better than corporations that promote more men than women? Um, so I think there is a there is a huge piece of the economy that's benefiting um, by the more top CEOs um, that are women, uh, and the numbers and the economy and the statistics bear that out. Um, I think the president was 100 percent correct. I mean, an equals day's work should be an equals day pay, regardless of your gender. And I think we should get out of the man men mentality. Um, leave it on television, but don't leave it in 2014 America. Um, and I think it's important to highlight those issues. I think it's important to remind folks of those issues every opportunity we can get. That A, we're not going to appreciate or tolerate uh, sexism, age, ageism, um, uh, anti-LGBT, I mean, whatever it is, you know, we're one big salad bowl of a country and we need to appreciate the pepper for tasting like a pepper and the tomato for tasting like a tomato and the salad. I don't eat rabbit food. I'm <laughs> but uh, that was a joke. <laughs> and, but uh, I think that's what the president's saying. You know, we're, we're one big America that's a very diverse place. We should all be appreciated for who we are and be compensated for the work that we do regardless of uh, what vegetable we are in the salad. I would just say ditto. Um, as someone whose wife uh, is actually the breadwinner in my family, I think it's great. Um, but you know, we've had, and I left we, my we, wife out. Like, she's an executive too. Yeah. Right? So, uh, look, if you work, you know, it's equal pay, um, and uh, I think um, we're behind in our society, but we're we're catching up. And I, I think it's good that uh, we talk about. Um, those kinds of issues. Uh, I'm not sure what the president could do on it, uh, but you know, clearly, when we have uh, you know more, more and more women running for office, more and more women that are CEOs involved in uh, every aspect, uh, and and you know, I, I think it's. Uh, I agree with Anthony. Ditto, and uh, you know, um, I, I'm proud that the women's college Republicans are here. So the woman from the college Republicans. <laughs> So anyways, um, I, I, I would just say that that's fantastic. I'm not sure what President Obama is going to do in terms of action, but uh, I'm glad that the issue is brought up. Yeah, I think as a panel, we're all going to agree on this issue. Uh, obviously, he's the only female on the panel. You know I agree with that. And <laughs> I would like to make as much money as the next, the next guy. Or more. Or more. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, but I have a problem. I mean, I don't really like the term an income inequality where when it comes to men and women or the rich or the poor. I think it's an opportunity inequality, and that's what we really need to work on and focus on. And like I, like Anthony said, or I mean Anthony and Tony said, I don't really know what what legislation is going to do with this problem because it's really up to the business owners, correct? <coughs> so um, yeah. It's about I guess I'm just gonna say I agree with everyone too. <laughs> um, yeah, like really the, um, he's saying something that really just um, needs to be addressed and um, it's something that um, definitely needs to be seen. Workplace equality is a very uh, important issue and uh, I guess I agree as well. It's kind of, um, there's really only so much that President Obama could do, which is why he didn't like emphatically say he's gonna propose like an executive order or like legislation for it, but rather he put it in the State of the Union because it's an important thing. He wanted to make a point that people back at home would understand that maybe the uh, businesses that are that would be watching would understand that, you know, it's a sort of direction that America needs to move towards. A few years ago, the president did sign the Lilly Ledbetter Act, right. and so that did begin a lot of uh, policies that employers have taken on to this day to, to lessen the gap between men and women in the workplace. So this is a sign that we like to turn it over to you all, our audience, and see if you have any questions for our panelists. Uh, if you do, please raise your hand. We'd be happy to call on you and um, 
When you ask your question, please let us know your name. If you're a student, tell us your major. And we just remind you that if you are addressing your question to someone with whom you may not agree, we can disagree, but not be disagreeable. <laughs> so does anyone have a question? Yes, sir. <laughs> William Rodriguez Morrison, State Precinct Chairman for the California GOP and candidate for State Senate for this district. I'm going to give you both the hard questions. I know Tony very well, and I know Mr. Portino very well. Actually, the question is about fixing our education system. We have K through 12. We've gotten rid of vocational education. Tuitions have went up. The DREAM Act, which I studied on, has taken away our community college taxes property taxes, and also university taxes, and how is that going to be fixed? Definitely. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I, I think there's a very simple answer. We as a society um, don't invest enough in your education. And frankly, one of the things, to tie it back to the President, one of the things that I appreciate about uh, President Obama is I have never heard a president other than him ever say the word community college. Most presidents talk about higher education as a four-year university, and <coughs> President Obama has consistently talked about uh, the role that community colleges play, um, largely for an immigrant population here in California, the first opportunity to have upward mobility. And certainly in California, we have more community college students than any state in the country. And so I think it's very, very important that we um, enhance uh, the community college system. I don't know if any of you did the two-year two transfer, um, but more and more students are choosing the community college and then transferring on to a four-year university. One of the things legislatively that I pushed while I was in Sacramento was breaking down the barrier between high school and community college, having seamless transition between high school and community college, academic partnerships, uh, what's called concurrent enrollment, allow students to go back and forth between community colleges and high schools. Certain rural parts of the state don't have uh, AP classes in high school, and so how can that student compete to get the weighted GPA with a more suburban high school where they have more uh, AP opportunities? Let that student go to the community college to get those classes. And again, you brought up uh, vocational education or uh, whatever you want to call it today. Um, again, the community colleges are playing that role. If you live in Orange County and you're going to work in one of the many uh, auto uh, organizations, you go to uh, Citrus Community College to learn how to be an auto mechanic. If you're going to be a lab technician, you go to PCC. If you're going to be a, a cosmetologist, uh, Citrus College um, has a wonderful cosmetology program. So um, I think we have to continue to enhance and, and, uh, and uh, support those institutions that actually take care of the lion's share of our students. Well, I, I believe we have to reform uh, the educational system. Think about the private enterprise if you're a small business. If you had uh, people that you were hiring and you couldn't hire the best or pay the best more money or you couldn't uh, punish ones that were lazy and not doing their job. But that's exactly where we are in the educational system. We're not rewarding uh, the best teachers. Uh, it's based on tenure. We're not, um, we're not punishing those who are kind of going through the system and just going day by day. Uh, I think we should uh, actually invest more, uh, but we also need to make sure it's a smart investment in being the reform movement. I'm very involved in the charter school movement as well. I think charter schools have been a really good thing for the state of California. But also, um, what I think our, our, our K through 12 system's kind of missing is not, my, my dad's a maintenance man. My dad served in Korea and Vietnam, and when he came back, he worked with his hands. And what, what this generation's done in terms of K through 12 is say every student is gonna to go to a university. My dad was not built to go to a university. And so what we've now taken out is a lot of the trade things, apprenticeship programs, things like auto shop, drafting. Those are kind of programs that, uh, again, not every student uh, was, was meant to come to a, a wonderful university like uh, USC. Uh, those who make it, congratulations, you're at one of the best uh, institutions in the, in the country. But, for example, my dad is a maintenance man. It, that was not where he was built. And there's a lot of good, high paying jobs out there that we're failing some of those students who could fill those jobs because we're not offering those kind of programs in the K through 12 system. Um, I agree with Anthony, the community college system, we need to invest in, and do more in terms of community college. There's a lot of students that go to a community college uh, for their basic education, then you transfer to a four-year uh, institution. 
So, uh, and there's a lot of community college. For example, for example, the College of the Canyons in my area, they work and they go out in the community and they work with local enterprise. And their average age, uh, I believe, at the community college level is in their 30s. Um, and because what they're doing is they're offering programs that actually fit the economy that's there locally. So uh, I believe we need reform in education. I believe we need to make sure if we invest more that we make sure it's a wise investment. And I believe in accountability and, and rewarding those who are doing a good job within our educational system. Okay. Um, do we have another question from the audience? Um, sure. Uh, Sheridan asked. Uh, my name is Sharon Watson. I'm a film major. Also representing the Daily Trojans. So. A film major, did you say? Yes. What's your favorite movie? Oh, of all time, probably Clue. Okay. <laughs> it's a very corny movie from the 80s. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm also representing the Daily Trojans, so mm -hmm. I hope you guys didn't say anything that you don't but, uh, my question, so now you tell us. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I saw her um, sneak in. My yeah. question basically revolves around the fact of what do you think could actually get done? Because I feel like no matter if you're running for president of like a university student government or for president of the United States, you're gonna have a laundry list of ideas that you want to happen. But we only have two and a half years now in this next term. What do you think realistically, President Obama? wants to focus on, and what do you think will actually pass? Because I'm guessing that we're only gonna get one sort of major reform, whether it be immigration, whether it be something with the budget. So what do you think could realistically happen in the next two and a half years? Do you wanna go? Oh my God. Yeah, you can go on. I think two things. Um, I do think there's gonna be immigration reform. I think, frankly, it's the Republicans that are gonna be central to the immigration reform outcome, though I thought it was interesting, Rubio today sort of downplayed the prospects of immigration reform, and most of the conversation last night was that it was going to happen, and then certainly the federal government needs to have a policy that makes sense for contemporary America. I mean, we've sort of changed it every 20 years, and, you know, based on convenience and not based on good public policy, and I think that's something that's going to happen. Um, but I think that'll be driven mostly by the Republican side of the aisle. Obviously, they control the House, so it's, it's going to have to come that, from that. Um, but I do think the, uh, the, the President um, made some very strong statements on natural gas, on environmental protection, and I think he's going to try to tie that back to jobs in the economy. So I do think you'll see something come out of, of that effort because I think that's something that, uh, you know, when you're in your second term as president, you start, I mean, it's human nature to think about your legacy. And I think, uh, obviously, the first term is gonna be defined by the Affordable Care Act. And I think there will be one more big initiative from the second term. Um, but I think it'll be the Republicans that'll drive the immigration, and I think the president will drive uh, uh, the environmental protection piece. That's my prediction. I think as I stated earlier, I, I, I really thought the tone of last night's speech, uh, I, I, I'm not sure what gets accomplished. In fact, uh, I think uh, most of the folks uh, right now back in Washington are focused on the 2014 campaign and they're not really focused. You know, too many times what happens, um, you know, is people are talking about what's good for Republicans, what's good for the Democrats in that prism instead of what's good for their constituents in the country. Um, and I think people are tired of that kind of debate. They, they want to see uh, action. And um, as was mentioned earlier, the debt, I, I think, is something that can be tackled. Um, and I think there's some common ground. Uh, Paul Ryan, uh, along with um, uh, the senator, I think it was, well, anyways, uh, they did a bipartisan budget just recently. So you're not going to have a government shutdown. Uh, you're not going to have these continuing resolutions. Um, and so I don't know what is, after last night's speech, I really don't know what there's the common ground where they're going to work together and get a lot accomplished. I think most of the members back there are focused on the upcoming election in 2014, to be honest. Uh, I have to agree um, with uh, Mr. Strickland a bit on uh, the fact that the State of the Union, it had a a very hopeful kind of energetic tone um, and like that's very evocative of you know uh, his speeches when he was campaigning it was very much a speech for the 2014 midterm elections he had that tone like 
He brought back issues that he hadn't talk about, talked about in a long time, one of them being Guantanamo. That's something that kind of like completely faded out since I think 2009, and it came back now. And with um, the midterms in the way, him having a kind of difficult year in the past year, he's trying to, you know, come back into this year strong, you know, kind of build the momentum for him and the party, the Democratic Party. And um, looking at things that could actually be done, I feel like, um, Looking at for like equal <coughs> opportunity, um, some of the um, things about um, uh, the minimum wage, and then um, uh, as some more, some other social mobility um, uh, issues. I think that's probably going to be his larger focus. I feel a decent number of things are going to be um, are going to fall through simply because of the nature of the State of the Union and the speech and how he gave a pretty long list of accomplishment um, things he wants to accomplish that possibly won't get accomplished. I do agree with Mr. Prashana when he said that Republicans are going to probably drive the immigration reform. And if the State of the Union was signed as any indication, uh, it was 2% of Obama's speech. So I don't know how much he's going to drive that, to be honest with you. Um, also, the things I think we can work on would, again, be creating jobs and reducing the federal deficit, which I think everyone can agree on both sides that we need to work on. He also talked about um, natural gas, but um, he neglected to mention the Keystone Pipeline. So I don't know um, how much is gonna be done as far as creating jobs through natural gas and the energy industry, which is so successful right now without Obama legislating to make it so. Do we have another question? Yes, you in the front row. Uh, Jennifer and Shikar, on Jennifer's last topic that we are currently undergoing an energy revolution in the United States, not on the alternative energy that has been supported by the President and by the Democrats for the last couple of years, but on wholly traditional sources of energy just with new technologies. Uh, I want to know from the student panelists what you guys think would happen were there to be an initiative by the federal government to invest uh, on top of investing in these these uh, these newfangled um, alternative energies, into also these new technologies for extracting coal, natural gas, different sorts of oil, shale oil, um, and what's what we can see happen to America's energy situation and American power, uh, were there to be a concerted effort, bipartisan, I assume, to. Um, to, uh, to do that. Uh, I, I, I'm going under the assumption that uh, that you guys won't think it to be a particularly novel idea or a particularly successful one, but I want to know your exact thoughts on this. It's an interesting policy to consider in the future. Yeah, well, I know, a lo I mean, I know a lot about fracking, which um, involves natural <coughs> gas, but he, um, you know, doesn't seem to be letting up with a lot of restriction, reg regulations regarding fracking especially in California, which I'm sure Mr. Strickland can speak to a little bit more than I can. Um, we are under the biggest <coughs> energy boom in, in the United States, and we could literally be energy independent ourselves from any foreign oil if regulations would just be, uh, um, if there would be a compromise between the environmental activists and the people that are trying to um, continue with fracking. Um, as far as all the other programs that you're talking about, the, um, I, I'm assuming you're talking about solar panels and you know, uh, wind turbines. The thing is, people don't think about, as far as solar panels, we're using raw earth materials. There's only a limited amount of that. Most of them come from China, and people are getting really sick because there's no, um, not a lot of human rights in China. So the people that are mining for these raw earth materials or solar panels, um, it's, it's really not a good thing. And I don't think the environmental people will understand that. <coughs> and again, with the wind turbines, it's, um, they use copper, which you have to mine for copper. So again, we're depleting the earth of copper. And if um, people would just be educated a little bit more in general about the alternative energy sources, I think they would take another look at fracking and try to come to some sort of compromise instead of just moratoriums to stop it. Um, regarding uh, like some of these alternative technologies for traditional sources of energy, it it's necessary in the short term, like for temporarily, like for example, Jerry Brown, he hasn't, um, I think in uh, the legislature, California legislature, there was a bill to um, ban fracking, but, uh, or at least severely restrict it, and <coughs> Jerry Brown vetoed it. 
And it's for the reason that um, fracking has some, um, um, Jerry Brown at least sees it as necessary for like the temporary scope. Um, and we need some of those sources because um, a lot of our investment to alternative energy, such as solar panels or wind, um, they aren't panning out as great as they are and the research isn't coming out as strong. Something that needs to be done is into other sources of energy that are often overlooked one of them being fuel cells, and also into technologies to um, store greater capacities of solar energy. These are often fields that are looked, by, looked over by both sides and fields that actually offer a lot of promise. For example, there's this um, startup up in the Silicon Valley that's um, trying to um, make the efficiency of solar panels go from 20% to 70%. And it's technologies like that that need to be done, not just, you know, hardcore just going, we need solar panels, you gotta look smarter. And that's something in the long term and the short term, I believe there is some merit to um, looking at some of the traditional sources of energy until we are able to smartly move over to alternative sources that actually work. Hey, um, we have time for one more question. Yeah, so shifting this discussion from domestic to foreign policy, um, quickly, a uh, big or a very common second term theme for presidents is Israeli Palestinians. It's a very common pivot for presidents. Um, do you think that President Obama will be addressing this issue in the second term? And if so, what do you think is a feasible path forward to achieving peace for both states? Well, I think you, uh, to talk about Israel and Palestine uh, uh, in terms of those kind of talks, you'd be ignoring uh, one of the biggest statements I saw last night uh, was uh, President Obama saying, don't send me anything in terms of Iran sanctions. Um, when you look at that body that he went to, uh, I would say 80 to 90 percent on a bipartisan manner are passing through legislation that says if Iran doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, the sanctions would be even stricter than they were before. And there's no question that Iran wouldn't have been at the table had it not been for strong sanctions in the, in the first place. So uh, I, I think until you solve the Iranian problem, you're not going to go to that next issue. I mean, the real big uh, issue facing foreign policy today is what are we going to do? And I believe that we should do everything in our power uh, to make sure that Iran does not get that nuclear capability. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I would say that was one of the things in last night's speech that scared me as well when he said that he'd veto any bill that came across his desk for new sanctions. Um, and he also was less than truthful when he said that Iran is eliminating their stockpile of, of nuclear weapons. Um, They're simply turning the uranium into oxide, which is also reversible. That's um, not getting rid of their nuclear stockpile. That's putting it on hold for when they want to use it again. And Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, this morning says that Iran's nuclear program has only been pushed back six weeks. And I don't think that that's all we can do to protect the world from Iran having a nuclear bomb. Uh, I'm going to go back real quick on the environment, then I'll touch upon the foreign policy if I could. I mean, we as a society have to figure out our priorities. I mean, if there's enough water in the bottle for us, is that okay if there's not enough water in the bottle for the next generation? And I think on energy, we have to get out of the mindset of, well, there's going to be enough fossil fuels, there's going to be enough traditional energy sources to meet our current demand. It's what are we going to do for the next generation and the generation after that? And I think we have to put policies in place that embrace um, alternative fuels and alternative uh, and cleaner ways of moving people and moving vehicles. Um, on the foreign policy, I, I think you're right, it's tempting for every president to think that you're gonna solve um, the problems in the Middle East. And it's a double-edged sword because the temptation to be an activist president is always there. But the solution, and this is just my opinion, is, is creating a framework where the folks there can dictate the solution. You know, when you have two children that are fighting when the parents come in and say, get along, they usually smile and then walk out of the room and start fighting again. It's up until they mature to look each other in the eye and say, we're going to dictate our own solution that you get a lasting solution. So to tell the Israelis you have to make 
certain things to tell the Palestinians you have to do certain things. They have to figure it out um, in a way to create a framework to do that. And to echo what Tony said, I do think Iran is probably the most pressing concern on most people's mind uh, at the moment. And I think, uh, again, um, that's a place that requires strong leadership, not uh, less leadership. That's my two cents. Um, I'm going to agree with uh, Mr. Portantino a bit on the Israel and Palestine issue. There's um, the main problem there is, I mean, the fact that both sides have gotten extremely polarized over the past few years. I mean, in the 1990s, they were the closest they were to peace, and then radical factions from both sides, you know, essentially hijacked the agenda. And I mean, it got nowhere since then. Every time they've tried, and yeah, it is once again, it's very ambitious of you know. President Obama and um, John Kerry to try to um, achieve this, and it's something um, that has to really come from within the Israeli side and within the Palestinian side. They both have to tone down the rhetoric. They both have to, you know, try to find that common ground. And we could try. We could try to facilitate talks and whatnot, but it ultimately has to come from them. It's not really going to come from us. Um, then regarding Iran, I could see why President Obama mentioned it. It, yeah, once again, is a huge concern for majority of the people back home. Um, one thing I found really interesting that he mentioned was um, the um, a spring up of Al Qaeda and other associated groups all around um, Northern Africa and Southwest Asia, and uh, that was um, I, I don't know if that was kind of, um, trying to be sort of a reference to the fact that you know he withdrew from Iraq, but. Um, then in Iraq, once again, you know, there's a resurgence, and it's trying to maybe show like uh, he's on top of things, he knows what's going on, and uh, once again, why he alluded to Afghanistan, the withdrawal, and he also talked about keeping a sort of policing force at the end. I think that's a hint at okay, I'm not going to let what happened in Iraq happen in Afghanistan, sort of thing. Uh. Okay, I think. That's about all we have time for today. There's a few announcements that I'd like to share with you before we wrap up. Uh, the first is that our next Students Talk Back discussion will happen two weeks from today. It's down in the second floor of this building in the Ros Rosen Family Screening Room. That's Wednesday, February 12th. Secondarily, our Sacramento trip, it's called the Sorrell Seminar on Political Leadership, will take place this year at the end of February. Mr. Strickland and Mr. Fortentino will be there with us, guiding panels, guiding discussions. So we encourage you all to uh, invest in this program by submitting your application. The deadline is next Tuesday, February 4th at 5 p.m. We take students to Sacramento for two and a half today, days to meet with legislators. We go to Sacramento B, meet with some of the reporters and editors. We meet in the governor's office. It's really a wonderful opportunity to get uh, primer on state politics in real time with real people. <laughs> Uh, finally, if you're looking for a political internship this semester, the deadline for registration in uh, PolySci 395 is this Friday, January 31st at 3 p.m. So if you're looking for a political internship, please stop by our office, VKC 263, and talk with our internship staff, and we'll be happy to, happy to help you find an internship. And then finally, we have uh, slated our next appearances with Mr. Portantino and Mr. Shicklin. We'll be on Wednesday, February 5th for a roundtable discussion. That's going to be in Mud Hall Room 102 at 7 p.m. I think that's the 12th. It's not the 5th. 5th is next week. Sorry, February 12th, not February 5th. Right. <laughs> Got that one wrong, sorry. No problem. In any event, I'd like to thank today's panelists for participating in the discussion. Anthony Portantino, uh, Shikhar Gupta, Tony Strickland, and uh, Jennifer Massey. Please join me in thanking the panel. I'd like to thank once again the USC Daily Trojan, and in particular, Yasmin and Sirhan for being our co-sponsors for today's discussion. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you, thank, you. thank you all for being here. We hope to see you in two weeks. Oh, you're <coughs>